Good day, everyone, and welcome. We're excited that you've joined the Tackling Workforce Management from the Top session. It's great to have so many in attendance, and we hope that you and yours are safe and well. My name is James Camareri, Vice President of North American Sales at COPC, and I will serve as today's session host. I'd like to start by introducing two of my colleagues and veteran COPC consultants that will be leading today's event. First, Brent Jernigan, Director of Consulting, he offers 15 years of experience in contact center process improvement while additionally specializing in quality systems and workforce management. And second, Scott Flewelling, who has been with COPC since 1999, is one of our most senior members of our team. And he has led client engagements in over 15 countries and is our certification practice lead. Both Brent and Scott uh, bring many years of experience on the client side, the outsource side and consultancy side of our industry and are also responsible for leading performance improvement in vendor management consulting engagements and for the delivery of many of our best practice training classes. The three of us are all glad to be here with you today. As some of you may be already familiar with COPC, I'll just take a quick moment to introduce uh, our organization. As our chairman and founder Cliff, Cliff Moore is quoted here, we are relentlessly focused on performance improvement for operations that support the customer experience. This is all we do. To expand upon that just a bit, we are a consulting firm that's been around since the mid 90s. We developed a performance management system and quality management framework known as the COPC customer experience standard to which many high performing organizations follow or are compliant with or even become certified. In terms of our solutions, we provide customer experience strategy, strategy and optimization consulting, which again focuses on performance improvement, strategic sourcing strategy and consulting for vendor management organizations customer experience and best practice training and certification. Some of the largest and most successful organizations use us to help guide them in driving performance. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, during the session today, the attendees will be muted, but we'll be able to submit questions. So at the bottom of the page, Dale, you'll see a Q&A button. Uh, so uh, feel free to submit as we go. Our one hour session will include about a 10 or 15 minute session after the presentation in which to field these questions. So again, please feel free to submit as we go. And then we'll close it out with a couple of short polls for feedback purposes. So please take a moment to respond to those as well. All right, with that said, I'd like to hand it off to Scott to get us started. Scott? Great, well, thank you very much, James. And thank you everybody for joining us, no matter where you might be in the world. And, uh, and so sort of good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, as, as the case may be. Um, so this is our agenda for today, and Brent and I are really first want to talk about what are the objectives of our session, uh, what are some common workforce, man workforce management issues that we've seen in our certification and consulting practices, and then as James mentioned, we'll have time for some question and answers. So please feel free, as Brent and I are going through the material today, to enter your questions in at the Q&A button that should be on the bottom of your screen. So what are our objectives for the session? Why do we put this together? I mean, this is tackling workforce management from the top. What do we mean by that? And certainly we find that many organizations are struggling with consistent delivery of their service objectives. And we're probably gonna talk a lot really about um, call centers and calls, though some of the things that we are, are going to discuss will be applicable to back office environments or retail uh, front office operations as well. But really, they struggle with their service objectives. How do we achieve a high level of, of service or service level for our customers, but also contain that within our budgetary limitations? And there certainly is a balance between doing that. So what, you know, what causes that struggle? And often, we find that this is caused by a lack of understanding of the art versus the science of workforce management. Certainly the science and there are excellent tools out there that uh, are, are put in place for uh, predicting arrival patterns, developing capacity plans, uh, helping out with real-time management. There, there is fantastic science in the uh, area of workforce management. Where the art comes in is in uh, the usage of those tools and understanding the unique circumstances that might be in place that require some manipulation. I think that this time period that we're all going through um, you know, in 2020 is really an understanding of there's going to be some art when we take a look at what's happened due to the pandemic and how is that going to affect our future volumes, our future arrival patterns, our seasonality that maybe was quite predictable in the first half of every year and is now quite unpredictable due to the circumstances. And that's where the art is going to come in. 
So we put this session together to really teach customer experience managers about the four pieces of the workforce management puzzle, which I'm going to go into a little more depth. So we really wanted to design this session to talk about what are some of the common issues and convert and also what are the solutions for that. So I'm going to say if you're looking for a webinar on the best usage of your tools and optimizing those or what are the best forecasting techniques, then I'm going to be quite honest, this is probably not the session for you. We have other sessions and trainings uh, where we get into that level of depth. But in this webinar, we really wanted to talk about the view from the top. And we certainly find, you know, every day that we have people that are struggling in these areas in terms of the, the problems that Brent and I are going to discuss. So CLPC in its history, and as, as James said, we've been around since 1996, our, our mission, this, this mantra has really not wavered in anything that we've done. CLPC in all of the work that we do, whether it's uh, customer experience opt optimization and consulting, uh, strategic sourcing, certification training, we're really driven around, we want service quality and revenue to go up and cost to go down. And to do that at the same time, so we have an increased customer experience and increased profitability. And when we talk about service, that usually means at the speed in which we deliver to the customers. And those customers might be internal customers and they might be external customers. And in a call center environment, we generally think of service or speed in terms of service level is one of the most common metrics, which Brent's going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, this is really underlying everything that's in the CLPC CX standard. Uh, there's actually a, there's a standard that's used for internal operations called the CSP standard, the customer service provider standard. There's a standard for outsourced service providers called the OSP standard. Um, and there's also uh, a standard for uh, those who outsource called the vendor management standard. So those standards, it's really underlying all of those standards is this concept of service quality and revenue up, cost down, increased customer satisfaction and profitability, and it actually works. So when we think about workforce management, how does that play into that mantra that I just discussed? And really, it's mostly focused on the service and the cost aspects of those. Workforce management is really guaranteeing an essential contribution in delivering an outstanding customer experience by use of the right amount of staff, not too many, not too few, with the right skill sets in the right locations, and those locations might be at home these days, at the right time, such that operations can provide a consistent high level of service while efficiently making use of the available res resources and, and reducing cost. So we really are trying to balance our labor supply with our anticipated demand, of course. And if we have too much supply, that's going to lead us in a cir circumstance where the people that we have in place uh, are not going to be effectively utilized and that's going to be expensive. Conversely, if we don't have enough labor supply for our demand, we're going to be in a situation where we're probably suffering on our service objectives such as service level. So workforce management is really about balancing this labor supply with the demand so we have the right level of service within our cost objectives. So as I mentioned on an earlier slide, COPC thinks of workforce management as a puzzle. And there are really four pieces to the, to the COPC puzzle when it comes to WFN. The first is forecasting. And forecasting, we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, forecasting is, uh, is really a long-term forecast. How do we hire and, and put the right people in place? But it's also short-term forecasting to ensure that we have them in place at the right time. That leads us into the next two pieces of the puzzle. The second piece is capacity planning and how we are actually um, developing our forecast in sufficient time so that we hire, train, and put people in place. And then of those people that we have, how do we actually schedule them so that we're not too far over or too far under? The last piece of the puzzle is real-time management. And real-time management is really a reactive piece of the puzzle. If the forecast is perfect, the capacity planning was right on, the scheduling was really done well, then there's nothing to do in real-time management. Sadly, that's not often the case. And this is why it's a puzzle because these pieces need to work together and they're, each piece is important and they're dependent upon the successful implementation of each of the other pieces in order to drive our business objectives relative to WFN. So let's get into some of the common workforce management issues that we see along with the solutions so Brent and I want to cover really four things. Do 
do we have the right metrics and targets in place? This is a question that we all often have from our, our clients and sometimes their service level objectives are set based upon you know, the company that they used to work for, a recommendation from somebody that they know in another organization. But we're gonna talk about how we should set the right metrics and targets in place relative to WFN. Forecasting, which I mentioned is the first piece of the puzzle. When should our forecast be locked and analyzed and what are the metrics that we should have in place for that? The third piece of the puzzle was scheduling. And why can't we actually schedule for arrival patterns? And we'll go through an example uh, that we have from one of our clients. And then finally, the last piece of the puzzle, which is the reactive piece. What should my RTM group, real-time management group, really be looking at? Brent, I'll turn it over to you, please, for discussing the right metrics and targets. Yeah, sure. Um, so executives often have some, some trouble determining what are the correct metrics that we should have in place, and, and maybe most especially, uh, do we have the right targets? Are, are the targets set appropriately uh, in order to help us balance service and, and cost? And so common questions that we find related to this, uh, really the, the primary one is how, how should we set our service level target? Do we have the right target? Uh, should we move that? What do we need to do relative to service? Uh, and then another one that we find quite often for um, vendors that are working, outsourcers, for example, that are working in a, in a VMO situation where they have a client and they, they have uh, other competitive vendors who are also part of that shared queue environment. Um, what, what should we look at? Because maybe service level is not the most relevant uh, thing in that situation. So let's, uh, let's talk about this for a second. So when we think about uh, inbound phone, for example, there are some things that can happen. So when the calls come in, uh, one of two things is going to happen. Either the system is actually going to pick up that call or there's going to be some sort of blockage. The call will be blocked. We won't, the customer will not be able to get it. Typically blocked calls would happen when we've done either a really, really bad job of forecasting. And so we don't have the trunk capacity to actually handle the amount of volume that, that's coming in or we may be in a situation where we did a really bad job or there were unforeseen circumstances about volume in forecasting um, that caused there to be way more volume than we anticipated. Uh, and I think we know from, from uh, just recent history that some companies are impacted, for example, by news reports uh, about their products. And as a result, those news reports might generate a, a tremendous amount of volume that the company didn't anticipate. And as a result, um, either they exceed their trunk capacity or they may make the decision to actually turn off the, the switch so that customers can't get in because they're trying to handle the volume that's currently waiting in queue, which may far exceed the number of people that they have to be able to process those transactions. Now, there's not really a good reason uh, to block calls. And even in that circumstance, uh, unless you had really good information that suggested your customers uh, preferred to get a busy signal to actually waiting in queue to have their, their query answered, uh, you probably shouldn't block calls. But those are really the two things that can happen. The system picks up or we block the calls. Once the system picks up, typically that's answered uh, by an IVR. And in the IVR, customers can do a variety of things. They may route themselves to the appropriate queue uh, on their own, or they may be able to accomplish some self-service uh, in the IVR. So if we're talking about banks, they may be able to check their bank balance. If, they're, if we're talking about billing, they may be able to check whether or not their, their bill was, their payment was received. Uh, could be a lot of different things that could happen in the IVR. Calls can abandon in the IVR. You wanna understand uh, the amount of calls that are being abandoned in the IVR partially because you want to understand the overall abandonment rate that's, that's occurring, but also because you want to understand whether or not the IVR is well designed. So our calls abandoning in the IVR may be an indication that customers aren't able to recover from a, an entry error, for example, or the paths to which they, they need to travel to get to the right queue are not necessarily clear in the IVR. Um, and so we want to understand uh, how many people abandon in the IVR to make sure that the IVR is well designed. Um, calls can be answered by a live router. So someone who actually does some triage of the calls and, and uh, they actually get the call to the correct place. They may capture some, some initial information from the customer about what the call is about and they can route the call appropriately so the correct agent handles that. 
And then finally, calls can be uh, offered to the queue. Now, when calls are offered to the queue, that's the place where we actually start to measure service level or speed of answer. Uh, it really starts once the call actually impacts the queue. That's an important thing to note because customers can do quite a bit prior to actually being involved in the queue. And if we start measuring service level at the point at which they hit the queue, that can sometimes misrepresent exactly how much time and effort the customers have engaged uh, just to get there to begin with. Once they've reached the queue, then one of two things is going to happen. Either the call is answered by a, an agent as soon as the agent becomes available to handle that transaction, or the call is abandoned in the queue if we make the customer wait too long. So if we don't have enough staffing, as Scott said, uh, if we don't have enough staffing, then our service level is impacted by that. It goes down. Uh, the implication of that is as customers begin to wait longer and longer amounts of time, they'll start to abandon their effort to get their, their query answered. Uh, and there's a relationship between those two things. Uh, almost always, it's a really, really strong relationship. So if we can take a look at that, Scott, I'll show you what this looks like. Um, so this graph is showing you the relationship. This is a scatter plot that's showing you the relationship between service level, um, and that's measured in the percent of transactions that are answered within 20 seconds, uh, and the relationship that that has with the abandonment rate. So each one of these dots represents uh, an individual day or an individual week um, that's measuring our service level and abandonment rate. It shows the location of both of those items at the same place. And that dot represents that day or, or week um, in which that performance happened. So in this particular graph, we can see that the relationship is really, really strong. Now, typically what you'd see in a scatter plot is there's an R squared value. I won't go into the statistics of R squared, basically all that's saying is how closely do the lines, uh, the dots fit to the line, the trend line. In this case, we can see that the dots actually adhere really closely to that line. So we can say that's a really strong relationship between service level and abandonment rate. And it's something that we would typically see. So in this organization, if you notice in the upper right hand corner, this organization has set its service level target at 80% of calls answered within 20 seconds and an abandonment rate target of less than 10%. Now, uh, I'm using this as an illustration. Typically, you're not going to find an organization that sets an abandonment rate target that high, although you might be in an organization that is doing that. We would say probably it's, it's more likely you'd try to target something like 5% abandonment rate or maybe even less if you're in a sales organization. But the question we wanna ask ourselves is, have we set the service level at the right target based on what we are trying to, to accomplish relative to the customer experience. Uh, in this particular organization, if we think that 10% abandonment rate is okay, then have we set the service level uh, appropriately? And as we can see from these lines, if we draw the line across to where that 10% abandonment rate intersects the trend line, we can see that we really don't need that level of service to drive that customer experience. Whether that's the right customer experience, separate question, but what we're seeing here is that uh, we could really achieve that level of abandonment rate if we delivered on about a 45 to 50% to service level, um, we would get abandonment rates lower than 10%. At the 80% uh, service level range, the actual abandonment rate that we are going to drive is closer to 2.5%. So it's somewhere between 2 and, and 3% is what we're actually going to deliver if we're delivering consistently on that 80% service level. So the question that you ask yourself is, what kind of customer experience do I want to drive? What's the appropriate level of abandonment rate that I should be targeting? And then work backwards from that through something like this, a tool like a scanner plot to identify what's the, the correct level of uh, service that I should be offering to my customers. Customers are telling you what their tolerance for waiting is when they abandon the call and you need to actually research that and understand at what point do we actually see the abandonment rate uh, start to, to rise to levels that, that we don't find to be acceptable. That's the inflection point. That's where we would wanna to try to target our, our service level uh, at that point at which we felt uh, the abandonment rate was becoming too high for what we we're trying to achieve in our business. Um, so Scott mentioned earlier that what we wanted to try to, to do in, in our organizations is deliver a consistent level of experience. 
for the customer. So we don't want customers to experience wildly different levels of, of service. Um, and as we talked about, we don't want service to be too low because the primary impact of that is on the customer. The customer experience is not good. If service level is really low, wait times are really high, we'll have lots of abandoned calls. Uh, we may miss out on sales opportunities, but in general, the customer experience isn't really good. If we over deliver on labor, then service level is going to be too high. So service level that's really, really high uh, actually represents uh, excessive cost and cost is what we're trying to drive out of the business. So we want to try to make sure that we're balancing uh, the cost and the customer experience by setting the service level appropriately. Now we figured, for example, in that, that prior uh, example, let's assume that that was a, a sales organization and what we really should have been driving was two and a half percent abandoned. 80% service level was the right target there. How do we drive consistency in that situation? How we drive consistency and what high performance organizations are beginning to do is to look, instead of looking at the service level threshold as a hard number that we just have to get on the right side of, they're actually setting a band around that service level. So uh, a little bit less than that service, uh, we're, we're setting the, the lower threshold and we don't wanna to drop too low because that has an impact on the customer experience, but also we're setting an upper band. We don't wanna to go too far above that threshold because now costs begin to be unacceptable. In this example, you can see the green bar. That green bar is set at about 78% to about 86%. That's the acceptable level that we think our, our service should be delivering on, uh, in which if we are consistently within that band, we'll be balancing both service and, and customer experience. Uh, as you can see from this example, and what we find when we go into a lot of organizations is um, companies are not actually very good at delivering that, that consistent level of service. So this organization is only within the band uh, two of the intervals throughout the day, uh, you can see around noon and also around 4.30 in the afternoon, um, they're actually within that band of 78 to 86. Uh, outside of that, the, the experience of the customer varies widely, right? Um, and so this is a really great way to try to drive consistency in your businesses, to set a band and then look to see what percentage of the intervals am I actually achieving that banded uh, service level target? Uh, and then I wanna, wanna try to drive a high percentage of my intervals to be achieving that level of, of consistency. Um, and, and Brent, if I could just uh, append onto that, I, I think that you know we've yeah. seen in many organizations that they measure their service level often at the end of the month. And sometimes we'll go into organizations and it'll be near the end of the month and we'll look across the floor and there's a, a, a whole bunch of agents that are, are not actually all that busy. And uh, yeah. as you question them, you say, this, this sounds like, you know, it doesn't look like a very good cost-effective solution. And they say, oh, we missed service level at the beginning of the month and we have to overcompensate at the end of the month so that we don't pay a penalty to our client because we're held to a monthly number. And so we are, are not fans of that approach. We're fans of getting down to the interval level and honestly, even to the prime intervals and managing within a band. And if you miss the band earlier in the month on the low end, don't make up for it by uh, having a costly interval at the end of the month. Um, that's just not an effective use of resources. And so the metric really should not be looking at service level on a monthly level, but the percentage of intervals in the month that were within the acceptable band. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Scott. And, uh, you know, it's one of those situations where organizations find themselves with, with really high costs and they're still not servicing their customers very well. And they wonder how they wound up in that situation. That's exactly how you wind up in that situation. You didn't buy back customer experience by running a really costly contact center at the end of the month. So uh, the intent here is to be much more consistent in the delivery of service. So what do you do if you're in a situation where um, you're in a shared queue environment? So you're one of many sites or many vendors that, that is supplying service to a, a client's customers. Um, and, and you recognize that those calls wind up distributed to the first available agent. Uh, in a situation like that, it's really up to the, the client. So at the level of the central switch, that's where service level and abandonment rate should be uh, measured and managed. So the client actually has some responsibility here uh, to understand, are they forecasting correctly? Are they actually getting you the information that you need to make sure that you're properly staffed? Uh, and then they're managing service level and abandonment rate across all of the vendors, not just for one particular site. 
it's not appropriate to, to measure service level and abandonment rate and uh, hit a site for the overall enterprise not actually achieving the, the targets when in fact that site may be helping you out and actually might be delivering more people uh, than they expected to, which is helping to preserve your, your service level. Or conversely, if service level is way too high, they may be harming you, but everyone gets hit equally in that situation when we're holding them all accountable to the service level and abandonment rate. So what should we actually look at in that situation? Uh, the proper metric to look at when you're in that shared queue environment is to look at something called schedule attainment. So this, uh, this table that we have at the bottom of the screen is from some work that we did with the client. So if we can kind of zoom in on that, Scott, let's talk uh, about what schedule attainment actually is. In the schedule attainment model, uh, the client actually does some of the forecasting. Uh, certainly, they, they try to forecast what the expected volume is, since they have a view of what marketing they're doing and some of the things um, that they expect to have happen relative to the transactions that are, are coming in. They may also do some forecasting of, of AHT. Usually, they would expect the, uh, the vendors to do some forecasting of their own shrinkage and what they expect in, in terms of, of shrinkage. Uh, but that's all intended to come up with an enterprise level capacity plan. So the client needs to understand overall across all of the vendors, how many agents do I actually need to have available to handle the transactions that are coming in? And then at the individual site level, what they hold the sites accountable to is actually delivering on the level of heads that the site can actually commit to. Uh, and so schedule attainment is a measure of at the interval level, uh, how many intervals did we actually hit the number that we committed to deliver to the client? So we want that to be a high percentage of the intervals. We want to make sure that we are consistently delivering the right amount of staff that we actually committed to the client to, to deliver. And what that does is that then puts the onus on the individual sites to actually manage to the right staffing so that at the, at the cloud level, for the client overall across the enterprise, they're getting the right number of people to preserve service level and to manage those costs. Um, so schedule attainment in that shared queue environment is actually the proper metric that you should be looking at uh, and you should be holding yourself accountable to that. Great, well, thanks Brent. Well, let's, let's talk about forecasting, which is, you recall when I talked about the pieces of the puzzle was the first piece of the puzzle. And uh, really you should have be asking your questions, you know, when should our forecast be locked? Do we have the, the right timeframes in place? And what, what forecast accuracy metrics should we be actually looking at? Because there's a lot of metrics to have uh, that you would have in an organization. So forecasting really, there's different horizons for the forecasting uh, uh, timelines. Uh, we probably have an annual business plan, so 52 weeks in advance. Uh, we're uh, developing some sort of a, a, a forecast that ties into the business plan, it ties into the budgeting um, uh, process that we'd have in place. Uh, you know, if we needed to open a new center, uh, we're probably gonna need months of time in order to, uh, you know, find the property and build it out and, and uh, all of those things. So we, we need that annual forecast. Then we also need a staffing forecast. I'm gonna talk about the time frame here in a second, but a staffing forecast is what's used for the capacity plan, usually done down to the weekly level, maybe down to the daily level. This is probably around 13 weeks in advance, but I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more on the next slide. And then we'll, we'll have a scheduling forecast and uh, that is going to need to be down to the daily level and, and honestly down to the interval level because we're trying to drive this interval level consistency on our service level or on schedule attainment as Brent just covered was also at the interval level. And, and that's probably gonna be about three weeks in advance. And then we're going to re-forecast and certainly there's gonna be intraday management, real-time management, things are gonna change. Uh, you know, what we do if we have a weather event at one of our locations, how is that going to affect things? What happens if there's a marketing campaign that we didn't know about? Um, uh, so those those are going to be reforecasted really on a, on a daily basis. Um, so we're we're probably down to X minus one. So so what are the forecasting timelines, and why did we say X minus thirteen? 
Well, the, there, there's time, of course, to operate, operationalize, that's a tough word for me, new staff and incorporate them in the schedules. And it's often about 10 to 14 weeks. So we've got to, you know, develop the a requisition. We have to recruit the staff and advertise, interview them, um, onboard them. We need to train them. And then we might have some form of nesting or academy bay. Now, in many organizations, this is going to take this entire process is about 10 to 14 weeks. So we just sort of set X minus 13. Now, we've been in organizations where uh, the recruitment is uh, perhaps uh, has a, a bank of people ready to go. Uh, the training is not all that long, and they might be doing this in less time. I've rarely seen it be less than eight weeks. Uh, we've been in other organizations where uh, the recruitment is quite specialized, the training is quite long, and I've seen this instead of being you know 10 to 14 weeks, we're talking um, you know four, five, six months in advance that we need to lock our forecast for um, for capacity planning purposes. Now, it's not, you know, honestly, you'll be more accurate if you forecast four weeks in advance instead of 13 weeks in advance. But what we want to capture is that we want to lock that forecast 13 weeks in advance, I'll call it three months in advance, so that when we made that decision to actually go and hire new people, how accurate were we? And if we aren't accurate, then what do we need to do to make a better forecast and a prediction in the future? So we would say, you know, let's say it's the 1st of September, we'd actually be forecasting for the first week of December, which would be three months in advance. And again, we'll change that forecast, we'll revise it between now and December, but we wanna lock it to understand how accurate were we when we developed that, uh, that requisition. Now let's get to the scheduling horizon. I said that was about three weeks in advance. And really, there's two components here. There's the schedule creation, which is done by the schedulers, of course. And then there's the schedule horizon, which is the promise to the staff as to how far in advance they'll get their schedules. In many organizations, schedules are produced for the staff about two weeks in advance. They're published, and uh, we require about a week in advance in order to create the schedules based upon the arrival patterns. Sometimes it's longer and sometimes it's shorter, but generally it's in that two to four week range. So uh, we'd be at X minus three as an example uh, for our, our scheduling forecast. Same concept, uh, you know, it, we would want to lock our forecast on the first week of September for the third week of September, if that was our time frame, And again, we'll revise it as we go forward, but we wanna understand from the time we reproduce the schedule, how accurate was our forecast. So we have to have the right forecasting horizons in place. And granted, you can be more accurate with a shorter period of time, but that didn't change what you actually did in the business. So what do, we, what do we need to actually forecast as part of these timelines? So this capacity planning, I'll say X minus 13, we of course need to, uh, we need to forecast our volume, which is uh, ant anticipate it. Um, uh, we need to forecast our planned and our unplanned shrinkage. I'll come back to that in a second. Our handle time, and then we actually feed in our service level objective. As Brent said, we're going to determine what our service level target is based upon our needs of our business and acceptable level of abandonment rate, as an example, or our cycle time target if we're dealing with non-phone transactions. That's not going to be a forecast. We're going to feed that in as what we desire. From a scheduling point of view, which is sort of X minus three, we would have our, our volume uh, down to the interval level, because now we're scheduling people at those intervals, which are probably at 30 minute intervals or perhaps 15 minute intervals. So we're producing this three weeks in advance. Our unplanned shrinkage, our handle time, and our service level or cycle time again is at target. Now, the difference between the planned and the unplanned shrinkage is that at three months in advance, X minus 13, we know people are going to take vacation. We just don't know who. We know that people are going to, uh, that they're going to need breaks and coachings and meetings, but those, uh, so we have to build that in as part of our planned shrinkage. When we get to the scheduling stage, we will already know, three weeks in advance, we'll say the people who have booked their vacations, we're going to schedule the breaks, we're probably going to schedule uh, some of the meetings and some of the coaching sessions and the training. So our shrinkage parameter is going to be different at the scheduling stage. At a capacity planning st stage, it would be not uncommon for us to see shrinkage calculations that are about 30% uh, because of all the uh, planned factors that need to go in. 
At the scheduling stage, uh, shrinkage is going to be highly influenced, uh, the unplanned shrinkage is highly influenced by your absenteeism rate, uh, as well as the degree to which you are scheduling activities. If you don't schedule meetings or coachings or trainings, then they have to win unplanned shrinkage. Some organizations, though it's not very common, don't actually even schedule the breaks. So they need to build that into the shrinkage allowance, though that would not be one of our recommendations. Now, the ones that are kind of in the, the salmon or the pink color are from the COPC CX standard, the recommended metrics that we should actually be tracking for accuracy purposes. So even though we need to, in capacity planning, forecast the volume and the planned and unplanned shrink and the handle time, uh, the standards committee that we're guided by determined that that was a little onerous to have organizations tracking all of those accuracy metrics. So a capacity planning stage, we would be tracking our, the accuracy of our volume that we locked 13 weeks in advance, as an example, at the weekly level. And at the scheduling stage, we want to track the accuracy of our volume three weeks in advance, as an example, at the interval level and our handle time at least down to the daily level. And if we're accurate, that's fantastic. But if we're not accurate, then we have to ask, how could we become more accurate so we drive the right objectives for the business? So now we'll get into the, the next concept, which is why can we not schedule to arrival patterns? And this is one of the main causes of that inconsistent service delivery that Brent showed on one of the previous um, uh, graphics. And it's a challenge in actually scheduling the arrival patterns. So the first question is, are we actually reviewing our scheduling to arrival patterns in advance before they're actually published to the agents? And then what is the balance between the needs of the business and the needs of the employee? And that's gonna change based upon your organization. So we should have a scheduling review process. And honestly, as uh, we deal in our consulting, uh, consulting work, I find that this is not very well done in organizations. It might be done by the WFM people, but not necessarily uh, to the degree it should be. And that review is not there with the other portions of the business, the CX managers. So the scheduling process should have a review on quantitative results and an action plan on whether we can release this schedule or not. So we wanna look at our service level goals and what's our projected level uh, of actual performance and ask where there's gaps. So this is an example from one of our clients, a, re a real example. And we were looking at the performance that they were having on service level on a daily basis. And we looked at the period from November until February. So we have essentially four months of data. Now, much like Brent's example earlier, this organization had a band of desired service level at the daily level, not even down to the interval level, but at the daily level where they wanted to be between 75 and 85% service level. To be above 85 was, uh, to repeat what we said earlier, is a little costly. To be below 75 is a very uh, poor experience. As we can see from this graphic, this particular client had very inconsistent performance by day of week. And as we track along uh, in, in the band, and the circles are denoting uh, some of the Fridays that we saw as part of this. So as we dig into this uh, and, and say, this is not a recent trend, this has been happening for months, why is this performance uh, uh, gap actually occurring? So as we dug into it, we actually looked at what was the projected scheduling or staffing, uh, scheduling the arrival pattern to the requirements two weeks in advance. So the way that we read this graph is that the vertical axis is the plus or minus on the number of agents. So if you required 100 agents and you scheduled 100 agents, we'd be at the zero line. We're not over, we're not under, we're just right. So that's how we read the vertical axis. So as we look at this, we have days worth of data. We have significant overstaffing on many days of the week, which leads to 100% service level. That is costly and not actually valued by the customers. If you answer the phone immediately, that actually doesn't drive high levels of customer satisfaction. If you answer it very, very slowly, it'll drive uh, levels of dissatisfaction. So these intervals are very costly. We have intervals where we have 150, 200 agents more than the requirement, which is gonna drive an extremely low level of, of occupancy. Conversely, we have significant understaffing in some intervals, and that is going to lead to a 0% service level when we dug into the data. 
That's a very poor customer experience. It also has an impact on your future arrival patterns because it's going to drive, as Brent showed us, the relationship between service level and uh, abandonment rate earlier. We're going to have higher abandonment rates. And if people have a need to talk to us, they're going to phone at a different time, which is going to distort our arrival patterns because we didn't have enough people in, in place. This was known by this organization, at least by the WFM people. If you dug into the data, the problem was there. And so people were questioning, why are we not hitting a service level? It was actually a scheduling issue. So why do organizations get into this issue? Well, scheduling is a process with multiple inputs, and it's, it's really a balance between needs. What are the needs of the business relative to cost? What are the needs of the customer relative to serving, servicing them in a consistent manner? And what are the needs of the employees? And honestly, uh, as, as a workforce management person, I would love it if the business had complete flexibility. I could produce schedules one day in advance for people. Uh, agents were available all hours of operation to be scheduled based upon the customer needs. Employees, however, do have needs as well. And they would like to, in many cases, have stable schedules with few changes that they would know their schedules months in advance, not two weeks in advance. Um, they want to know that it's at least um, released in a timely manner with advanced notification, and it's convenient to their personal life. I mean, I think we'd all like it if we didn't have to work nights or weekends and could schedule around those activities, but we have to be a customer-focused organization and how we put that in place. And balancing this need, uh, these, uh, these needs of the business and the customer and the employee is quite difficult. So you really should ask yourself, how flexible are you in your scheduling? The organization that I just gave in the example was not terribly flexible. So some of the questions you would say is, how flexible do we think we are in scheduling to the, the needs of the customers, which is what we're there for? And flexibility from whose perspective? Are we overly flexible for the employees' needs? And that's having an impact on our business needs. Um, are we using part-time agents? And should we? Um, what are the lengths of our shift? Many organizations we deal with have a standard, you know, everybody works an eight hour shift, uh, you know, over five days, but maybe you need some creative shift patterns, especially if you've moved through the pandemic to a work at home environment, there may be a lot more flexibility that's at your disposal. How much of the flexibility, inflexibility is due to a written agreement? How much is due to your past practices? I've been in organizations where people were, when they were hired, actually told by HR, you could actually have this shift for the rest of your employment here, which really handcuffed the people in scheduling uh, and what they could do in terms of flexibility. And honestly, what was your opinion if you were open more hours? I've been in organizations where there's a, um, there's a uh, great deal of volume first thing in the morning and there's still volume in the evening when they shut down. And what's that that is doing is it's forcing the customers into a distorted arrival pattern. And honestly, if you were open more hours, that would allow you more shift patterns. And that would actually uh, better meet the needs of the callers um, relative to the open. So examples of some flexible scheduling rules, uh, breaks could be uh, two 15 minute breaks could vary each day. This is really flexible, but the agents don't find about what their, their breaks are for the day until the beginning of the shift. Um, agents could work any open hours with agreed availability, not just specific days or night shifts. Um, shift bid schedule rotations are done regularly and not necessarily with regard to seniority. We're actually fans of incorporating some performance metrics into the uh, shift bid uh, process. So um, these are examples of really flexible rules and they may not work necessarily in your organization depending upon where you are on the pendulum. <clears throat> What's our policies relative to overtime? And um, should we send people home early release, voluntary time off? And this really should be done according to strict business needs at the interval level um, for any period for specific agent queues, which is a function of real time management, which Brent, I think you're going to talk about next. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I guess the, the final piece that, that we wanted to talk about is organizations sometimes struggle with their real time management groups. Um, and, and certainly there are some things that they, they find happening. They don't feel that they're getting the best value from real-time management or um, it's not actually able to react quickly enough. And so questions that we typically run into relative to this are, first of all, um, you know, what should real-time management really be focused on in terms of managing? So should they, be, should they be tightly focused on whether or not agents are adhering to their schedule or should they really be focused on, on queue performance? And what's the balance between those things? 
Uh, and the other big question that the organizations have is, um, why are we not able to react quickly enough to the, the changes in circumstances that are impacting the, the center? Uh, so what we find typically is when an organization is, is in that sort of situation in which they're not able to react quickly, um, that, that there are problems that are occurring relative to real-time management, uh, real-time management's primary focus is on adherence of, of the agents to schedules at the minute level. So we're very, very focused on uh, did people arrive exactly when they were supposed to arrive? Did they go to break exactly when they were supposed to go to break? Did they leave at the end of the day exactly when they were supposed to, to leave? Uh, and they're focused on a minute by minute metric that's really down to the, the 15 minute interval um, or maybe the 30 minute interval depending on, on your level of business. But what's really lacking in those organizations is a focus on the Q level uh, performance and the impact that agents are having on that Q level performance. So the real focus of, of real-time management should be on uh, preserving service level, making sure that we are at the right level of service for the customer experience, uh, and then within that, trying to manage the, the level of staffing that we have. That may actually require for some agents not to adhere to their schedules, and we may drive that by decision in order to preserve the experience and make sure that we're delivering on our, our commitment to the customers. Um, also, we get into situations when there's some sluggishness in the ability of real-time management to respond. Um, typically, that's because we don't have a good view of what we actually expected to have happen over the course of, of the day. So best practice companies would have RTM groups that are actually focused on uh, what are the situations that we expected to have happen over the course of the day? Which intervals did we actually plan to fail. We knew that we didn't have the level of scheduling necessary. We didn't have the right amount of staff. Uh, either we were going to, you know, by intention, we were going to be understaffed or overstaffed so that we can manage that uh, appropriately. And sometimes we shouldn't take action. Uh, certainly we shouldn't take action that we know has long-term consequences if the situation that we're experiencing is something that we plan to have happen and we knew that it was going to take place over a short amount of time. So if we were understaffed, but we knew we expected to be understaffed for one or two or three intervals, we might not do anything in the real-time management group because we know that situation is going to correct itself when we have more staff come on in an hour, an hour and a half. Um, if we take action in a situation like that and we try to, to retain people or we try to call people in, then we wind up being overstaffed in those later intervals and that has a long-term impact on us and has implications for cost. Uh, conversely, if we were overstaffed, that also may be a situation that's going to right itself over a short amount of time. And if we have a view forward to that, we know we don't have to take action immediately. That's a situation that's going to resolve itself. Um, really sluggish real-time management. There's a number of reasons why this occurs. Uh, it can be unclear where the responsibility lies for, for taking action. Uh, so is that, is that on the operations to take action on situations that are occurring? Is real-time management's role merely to inform operations and operations actually has to execute on what they're being asked of by real-time management? Uh, there can be really unclear guidelines for real-time management about what they're supposed to do, who they're supposed to contact. Uh, we find situations where, where real-time management is physically distanced from operations has an impact. So it, you may be in the same building, but on a different floor, you may be in a different site uh, you could potentially be on a different continent and be responsible for real-time operations. Uh, and that typically makes things more difficult in terms of dealing with situations that are maybe non-standard situations where you need to, to try to communicate quickly to someone. You might not be able to reach them in the, in the time that you need to. Um, we find a lot of organizations are trying to manage real-time, but using chat to do that. So they're, they're actually have uh, a chat room open and everyone's supposed to be paying attention to the chat room and real-time management is chatting their observations in, into the room. Uh, and quite often, uh, as, as we know happens, uh, team leads or the operational folks are really busy with putting out fires. And as a result, maybe they're not actually monitoring those chat groups very closely. Uh, and the end result is that we are not taking the right actions at the right time with the right people to preserve our service level. Uh, sort of 
related to that and just sort of a different avenue by which we might try to manage real time, we've also seen organizations that use email to try to communicate out real time instructions uh, to team leads or the operations staff. And, and again, the same problem occurs, right? If you're a team lead and you have 20 people who are clamoring for your attention and you also have to plan out your quality monitoring and your coaching sessions and you have to have uh, conversations for people relative to their ab uh, absenteeism, you might not be paying that close, uh, uh, close attention to your email to be able to react quickly uh, to call outs that real-time management is making. And so that design of how real-time management communicates with operations to execute on what their observations are is really, really important. Uh, and then finally, no real feedback to real-time management. So operations is not actually giving real-time management any, any feedback, or maybe we don't have good visibility into what's actually uh, occurring on the floor uh, in real time. And as a result, we are not able to actually uh, identify when situations are occurring that are outside of what we would expect. So best practice organizations are, are typically going to have really good training uh, specifically on what are the procedures that you should execute on and when should you actually execute on that. Typically organizations that are doing a good job of this would pre-plan what the day actually looks like. So uh, at different intervals of the day, depending on what circumstance you're facing, whether service level is low or service level is high or it's spot on, there may be actions that, that we can pre-approve real time to take so they don't actually have to seek out approval to, uh, to execute. Um, then we also want to make sure that operations staff have, uh, have dedicated time to real-time responses, right? So we need to make sure we know who in operations is supposed to execute and that they have the time and, and ability to actually do that. Uh, and then finally, making sure that we have the right technology. I've been in organizations where, uh, where the technology relative to the floor walkers who are supposed to, to actually execute on that isn't really designed to allow them to walk the floor while they're executing. So, so specifically, they have to be at their desk viewing the communications coming in and then go find whoever they need to, to address in real time. It's not a very good strategy. So you wanna make sure your technology actually allows them to be able to have visibility while they're on the floor walking around executing on the different instructions that they get. Really great way to do that. Uh, a lot of organizations are beginning to use tablets or iPads. Uh, where they actually have visibility into what's going on and they're receiving the communications. That also allows them in some organizations, we actually create uh, floor maps where we can see who is seated where on any given day and we can, we can literally go find the right person because uh, as you know, in many organizations that have sort of hotel seating, it's whatever's available, you might not actually be able to find the right person unless you already know where they're sitting. Technology can help you overcome that and provide some insight to you so that you can see uh, what's actually going on. Great, well, well thank you very much, Brent. Uh, James, I think maybe we could uh, launch a poll here for a minute and then we'll wrap it up and have a, a couple of minutes for any questions that have come That's in. That's right, we're a little, little long on time, but uh, really great information. Thank you both for presenting. Um, so before we get into some Q&A, we, we have a quick poll here, which I'm gonna launch. Um, just get that launched for you real quick. All of you should see that on your screen. Um, and this will just help us a little bit as we uh, try to better understand where your organizations are related to your current workforce management issues that you might, that you might be experiencing. So feel free to um, choose all that apply here. We'll give you just a couple of moments to get those rolling. Thank you for that. Then we're going to get into some Q&A. We've got some questions that have come in. Great. Okay. So eager to to get those to the guys. Okay. Yes. So as that's happening, let me just uh, maybe, jump uh, in. Here. Sorry. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just go on to the next screen for a second, James, and then we'll have sure, we'll a question. So just, uh, just so you're aware, you know, CLPC has a lot of experience in workforce management. We, we provide training, um, training to staff, schedulers, real-time management, uh, people involved in capacity planning. Uh, we do certainly a great deal of consulting on uh, workforce management best practices, including the implementation of playbooks that organizations will use. 
Um, we, uh, for some of our clients, will come in and, and do a benchmark review, really on the four pieces of the puzzle that we talked about, and you know everything from do you have the right targets to do you have the right real time management uh, approaches in place. And then finally, uh, CLPC actually offers certification to the full standards, uh, but also you can get certified, process certified in just workforce management. So, uh, James, I think we've, we've got time for a, a couple of questions. A couple of questions here. Yep. Uh, first one that came in is uh, we have a callback system in place. How does that affect the calculation of service level? Oh, sure. Okay. So Brent had put up the, uh, the diagram that had the block calls and, uh, and those sort of things. And uh, callback systems are great. I, I think they're fantastic. Those are systems where you'd put in place uh, where you'd say, you know, the anticipated time in queue is going to be 15 minutes. Uh, would you prefer to have a callback? Um, you would only display that message to the callers or, or project that to, to the broadcast it to the callers if you are actually not going to make service level. So, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we're guided by a standards committee. The standards committee determined that that would actually uh, be a good thing to put a callback system in place, very friendly to the customers. It avoids abandons, uh, but it actually would be considered to be a miss on service level. Uh, because we obviously wouldn't do that if we were appropriately uh, staffed and scheduled. Okay. James, okay. any others? Uh, yep, just one more here uh, that we have time for. Uh, I noticed that you spoke mostly about service level. We use ASA or average speed of answer. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, certainly ASA is an acceptable uh, metric. I will say it's not all that common a metric uh, these days. And one of the things that's uh, a little different about ASA, which is average speed of answer, is the average uh, speed of answer is uh, only in place, uh, only in place, sorry, for the calls that were actually answered. And so uh, service level is usually calculated as the uh, percentage of callers that were answered within threshold uh, divided by those that were offered. So an abandoned call counts against you. So it can be a little bit different when you manage only on ASA uh, because it's, it's averaging the customer experience. And if you had one caller who was answered in five seconds and one that was answered in, uh, in 60 seconds, it would, it would average out. Um, so it, it's not a, a common metric, it's an acceptable uh, metric, but uh, certainly service level is what we predominantly see, uh, which is why we talked about that today. Yeah, if I could add one thing on that, I, I, I would say if you do, if you are in a situation where you're measuring average speed of answer, um, it's probably really important to actually take a look at the distribution of calls around that average speed because people have a tendency to think that, that an average actually indicates sort of the center of the data and that's what most people are experiencing. And in fact, I think if you look at your ASA, what, what you will find is that you have a, a huge weight of calls in, in which people are experiencing something much faster than that average, but you also have a, a pretty long tail and some people are still experiencing really, really long wait times before they're actually able to have their, their transaction answered. So I, I would say uh, ASA is a great thing to measure. I would probably measure it in addition to service level. I might primarily focus on service level, but measure and understand the distribution around the ASA just to understand what the customer experience actually is. 